Um, yet there is a lot of actually a lot of issues that there is in that uh, in that space. So why am I talking about this uh, problem particularly? So my name is Alaidin. I'm the co-founder of Ostala, which is a mobile security scanning. Uh, product. Before start, um, starting um, co-founding Ostalab, um, I worked and come from a security engineering background. I worked at different um, uh, positions um, in security automation in the past. My previous one was at Google, where I was at the uh, part of the security automation team, and where third-party dependency was one of the nightmares I had to deal with, and particularly in the um, in the cloud space. <clears throat> so, um, to actually present you the 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 problem that we're trying to solve, I'm going to start with a story of a, of a, of a bug. So um, Cordova, if you're not familiar with Cordova, Cordova is a multi-platform mobile uh, framework that allows you to write um, Android and iOS applications in JavaScript. It's a very popular framework that other um, tools like uh, Ionic, for instance, are based on. And it has a plugin ecosystem that allows people to write uh, plugins in JavaScript to extend the functionality of the framework. Um, Cordova plugin and Master HTTP is one of the common ones. Um, it has over 12 downloads every uh, week, and it allows you to do HTTP requests uh, through JavaScript. The, if we look actually at the uh, security advisories for this particular package, we'll see that there is not, none has been reported. NPM has started um, um, uh, providing a page with all the advisories for all of the JavaScript packages. Uh, they try to, up, they've been more active on updating and providing accurate data uh, recently, uh, but however, there is none which is uh, available for this particular one. If we look, go to the GitHub page, and this is something I'm not sure if you're aware of, GitHub several months ago, they added support for um, publishing security advisories. Um, uh, package owners can actually even request a CVE number, and that gets uh, it's it's just one click away to get uh, to get a CVE assigned to uh, to that particular package. And in this case, there is actually none that has been that has been reported either. However, if if we dig deeper, this application uh, up to version 2.0.6. It was using a particular version of uh, com.github.givenzavisky. Sorry if I'm pronouncing the name incorrectly. Uh, um, uh, it was using this particular uh, Java dependency. So the, the way Cordova plugin works is that there is uh, the, you write code in Java, which needs to interact with a native API, and this is done through a uh, glue code, which is usually either in Java or Kotlin for Android or um, Objective-C or Swift for iOS. And uh, that does the glue between the JavaScript code and between the native API. And in this particular case, it is using this, this dependency, which is not referencing through like an external dependency. It's really taken the code and copied into, into the project. And this particular dependency has never been updated actually for several years. And it has a CVE which allows it to not validate the SSL certificate. Now, the, the, the weird thing is that the CV that was reported actually mentions Cordova. However, um, the, all the references are pointing to the original GitHub repo of the Java application, and none actually mentions the, um, the uh, Cordova plugin, which is probably the one that uh, was used to detect this issue. So this information actually, if you check in most vulnerabilities, in all vulnerability scanners or, or um, other uh, uh, public and private feeds, none actually reference uh, this Cordova plugin is vulnerable, and actually, they, what they mention is actually the the uh, the jar of a Maven package, which is accessible in in um, uh, in, in Maven. And therefore, this vulnerability is actually probably not known other by the person who identified and the people who fixed it uh, in the in the application. So this is unfortunately one of the many cases that there is of um, of the problem that we see in depend in 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 the security of um, of dependencies. And I'm going to show the, I'm going to show other examples. Unfortunately, there is way way too many. And honestly, if you dig into uh, two thirds of the of the CVEs, we'll see that there is missing information, incorrect data that is in there. So why are we looking into this problem? So um, we will also have, which is a mobile application security scanner. Our goal is to automate as much as possible of the uh, mobile application assessment uh, and by providing uh, advanced tools to review the application. The way we do this is that by simplifying the process, all users have to do is just come to the platform, upload their application, and then within hours, they have access to a report. Uh, without actually giving into a pitch of how does it work, uh, there are multiple stages of analysis. There is initially a static stage analysis that will take the application, do a set of configuration checks, like check is debug mode enabled, check permissions, check set of uh, settings of particular frameworks, 
Cordoba, for instance, has a whitelist that needs to be can be hardened for for to to prevent exploitation of uh, certain classes of vulnerabilities, uh, and these are checked during the static analysis. Then there is the third party dependencies, which this is the the one that I'm going to be digging deeper, which will try to determine what dependencies do you have in your application and is there any vulnerability in them. And finally, there is a taint analysis, and that one will try to trace execution within the code and see if there is a particular input that is reaching a particular method which could be insecure. And that one will flag vulnerabilities like insecure cryptography, will flag vulnerabilities like a SQL injection if an input is coming from a, from a user and is not validated. All of those would be flagged during the taint analysis. What happens after the, the application, um, there is a dynamic analysis where the application is installed in a device. There is some passive instrumentation which will hook, create critical APIs like crypto API, file system, network, and IPC. And then there is a monkey testing, which is a common UI pattern, where there is a program that starts clicking around in the application. Uh, it's all even possible to specify credentials or to specify a fake credit card number or a fake email, and those would be exercised during the test. And in parallel, there is an active uh, fuzzing that will list, for instance, what content provider does the mobile application have? What URL schemes does the application have? What services that uh, accepts intent does the application have? And those would be fuzzed and will try to flag vulnerabilities like a SQL injection, uh, arbitrary file access that can lead to uh, compromise either from another malicious application or could be actually uh, exploited from a browser uh, through, um, through URL schemes or through intents uh, that are accessible in Chrome. Uh, during this phase, there is a network which is collected, and that one is sent finally to the backend, and it does passive and active checks, checking stuff like secure headers. If it has course, is the course policy um, um, uh, secure with other elements? And then there is the active checks that will try to check if the uh, classical backend vulnerabilities like SQL injection, template injection. All of these, we have our own approach, and, and um, each actually we can dig a lot deeper into. But today, I'm going to be only talking about third-party dependencies and the problem that, uh, that we are seeing. So before I dig into the topic, I think it's actually important to agree on certain terminology, uh, terminology and how things work. So how are third-party dependencies used? So there are at the moment several, um, uh, depending on the language and the framework which are used, there are different uh, dependent, um, dependency management uh, or package management tools which are used. Uh, Gradle is not exactly a package management. It relies on, on on the Maven, and there are multiple repositories that hosts, um, in, in the case, for instance, of Android, either jars or Android archives and, and um, uh, to be added as dependencies to the application. Uh, for instance, in the iOS world, there is Cocoa Pods, which uh, is, uh, there is a new one that has been released by Apple for Swift dependencies, but it hasn't picked up a lot in, in, in the mobile space yet. There is an NPM mostly for JavaScript, and it's used by most uh, multi-platform frameworks like Cordova, Ionic, React Native, etc. Nugget is the one which is common for the Microsoft and the .NET world, and this is the one that's used to uh, reference uh, external dependencies. Or people might not use any of these, and actually they would simply copy code, which still is a common pattern, particularly when it comes to native code. Like, for instance, you have a native code reference in OpenSSL or uh, FFmpeg or some other library, because there isn't, in, in that world, there isn't really a great support for packages it may, in many cases, it makes sense to just copy the code and actually import it and reference it, uh, either through a static library or, or, or directly through the through the code. So, um, one important thing before I dig into this is that there are different classes of package management tools, um, and there are one of the uh, um, differentiator is that there are lock-based package management and non-lock-based package management. And I'm going to show after why is this important. So. Log-based package managers, what they do is that they create a log file. Log file, what it does is that, imagine I have, in the case, for instance, of a JavaScript um, framework, you have a package.json that specifies all the uh, dependencies that you have. You might actually be accurate and specify exactly the exact version that you are depending on. However, these versions will likely have their own dependencies, which will also likely have their own dependencies, and which will not be explicit in your package.json. So what happens is that the log file will actually recursively fetch, uh, um, fetch all the dependencies that you have and put them in your file. And this has the advantages that if, for instance, there is, um, uh, um, there is uh, when you are building your application or we are deploying through UCI CD, you will be using the version that are in the log file instead of um, fetching the dependencies at, at build time, and you might end up with dependencies which are different from your test or your uh, dev environment, and in some cases, 
And we have seen this, you have a, a breaking change that happens and it is breaking in production uh, and, and, you know, and you didn't manage to catch it in tests or, or your dev environment. Uh, the problem is that this kind of practice has a side effect from a security uh, point of view, uh, because it also means that you're not going to be picking up patches. If there is a package which has a which has a, a, a vulnerability, you're not automatically going to be uh, picking up a patch because there is a new updated version. You need to be explicit about I'm upgrading this package or I'm updating it to a new version because I would like to uh, fix this CV. And this is why you'll see, for instance, NPM will uh, warn you that there is a vulnerability you need to fix it, but the quality of that result will only depend on the quality of the data that they that they have. So. This is how package management works. Now, how the third-party ecosystem really works. So at the heart of uh, third-party dependency, there are CVE numbering authorities. There are over 100 CVE numbering authorities, and these are um, a variety of either vendors, uh, certs, government agencies, bug bounty companies, um, or even vulnerability feeds themselves. And these CVE numbering authorities, what happen is that they receive requests from either a security researcher or another vendor who is not a CVE numbering authority, and they will generate a CVE for them. The scope of what these authorities can provide, well, it depends. For instance, Apple is a CVE numbering authority, but it can only generate CVEs for Apple only. And these CVEs uh, are then added to the NVD, which is the National Vulnerability Data Feed, and that will by itself feed either other um, other uh, other feeds like uh, operating system feeds or be used by vulnerability scanners. For instance, um, uh, Ubuntu, Debian, uh, Red Hat all um, <coughs> all use uh, all provide their own vulnerability feed. And what they do is that once there is a CVE which is public, they will take that information and then they will generate. They will say this particular CVE exists in these packages. They might actually extend it to not only the library but other libraries which are using it. And then they will give you accurate information where that vulnerability exists. In parallel to this, there are private feeds. So the thing is that uh, requesting a CV is not always done, and particularly in the open source library world, where some libraries are either moving too fast, or the or, or the maintainer either don't know or don't care that they can request a CV. In those cases, there is a lot of libraries that never get a vulnerability published. So those private feeds, what they do is that they will um, uh, they will um, scout, scout, they will um, search in the internet. They will, for instance, analyze GitHub pull requests. Uh, issues, uh, uh, get exploit DBs and other resources to try to determine if there is a vulnerability which is known, which hasn't been reported. And these are added to their feeds and then they, uh, this is accessible uh, accessible afterward that could be used in, 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 in vulnerability scanners. One of the issues, however, that exists is that some of these feed providers are also CV numbering authorities and they have this conflicting interest between uh, providing you with a, with a, uh, pro providing a paid feed which which has a high quality by having private information versus actually um, publishing CVE numbers uh, with with exact data and in many cases you will see actually that uh, the information that they provide is not complete or is not accurate and they would actually point you to their private feed where you would actually go to fetch the, the full information which impacts the um, uh, the uh, some open source project that rely on that information or actually any other uh, pro uh, project that actually relies on that information. So CVs, what they do is that they tell us exactly what vulnerability exists, but we need exactly to match how the vulnerability, where does the vulnerability exist? And this is using CPs, which is a common platform enumeration. So common platform enumeration is composed of different attributes. The first one is the part, which tell us, is this an application? Is this an operating system? Is this a hardware? And then other vendors, the most important ones are the, uh, sorry, other attributes. The most important ones are the vendor product version. Um, others are less commonly used or they are not used in a consistent way. Um, and uh, these are actually the way that is used to identify the, the a certain application. These are afterward need to be mapped against um, a CPE dictionary, which is a completely different file that has human readable information, but not something that allows us to accurately identify an application. And just say, for instance, this is COVID safe uh, Android application in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a string format with some extra references. <clears throat> The issue is that there's actually more complexity to this. Um, the NVD has is, is actually almost language with a, with end and or operators, and um, some um, 
in, um, uh, attribution will actually will use multiple CPEs to say this is, for instance, this application, and it uh, and it applies to this particular operating system. Like for instance, instead of saying Android in the software uh, attribute, it will use two CPEs to actually mention it. Versions are also not necessarily always mentioned in the version field. There is an extra attribute which mentions versions, and that one that tell you that this impacts version one zero uh, included up to version one point one, not not included. There are other attributes, like for instance, there is a, the vulnerable attribute, which is in 99% of the cases are set to true, uh, except for three or four cases, it has the merit of existing, but it doesn't really add much value. So <clears throat> this is this is the, the, the status of how things work, how we are aware of vulnerabilities and how things get matched and reported. So what are the, actually the issues that exist with this? I'm gonna mention only some issues and I'm gonna uh, skip uh, over the most. But uh, and I've only actually added uh, the re um, I've only referenced uh, recent ones, and honestly, I think you can go through a CVE, take uh, two out of three, and honestly, I think you will find a lot of issues with incorrect data or some issues. So this is an example of a CV of a CV that says here that it is affecting Apache HTTP server 11.1, 12.1, and 12.2. However, if you are familiar with Apache HTTP servers, there is no such thing as a version 11.1. I think the latest one are 2.4 or 2.5. I don't exactly remember, and uh, this actually doesn't match. If we go to the description, we'll see that the, actually this is mentioning Oracle HTTP server, and not Apache HTTP server. And Oracle has its own CPE, and this is mentioning a completely different version that doesn't exist. And there is no way that we will miss either this or we will inaccurately match against something that doesn't exist. This is another issue, for instance, which is affecting OutSystem. OutSystem is a multi-platform mobile application uh, uh, framework uh, which allows you to write application without any code. And this one, for instance, the CVS says this is disputed. There's a disagreement between the, the person who reported it and between the vendor saying this vulnerability doesn't exist. And us, uh, anyone who actually is using the information, have no way to verify that. And naturally, what will happen is that this information would simply be uh, discarded because there is no way of verifying it. This is another example of um, uh, Struts libraries. So Struts are a Java library which have been known for some high profile um, um, vulnerabilities like uh, uh, remote code executions, open redirects, which led to actually high profile compromises. <clears throat> and in this case, the, the, the CV information, the, the team who owns the package have said that they updated the information saying that um, we said before that version for this particular CV, that version 2.3.7 up to 3.3.33 are vulnerable. Actually, we are incorrect. It's actually everything uh, before uh, up to version 2.1.6. And if we go to the CV, that information was never updated and we will not be able to actually match against that. I honestly have many other examples, like, uh, but I'm going to honestly quick, uh, like, skim over them. But the uh, the 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 bulk of of the um, the the the, um, the outcome is that there is so much bad quality of the data that honestly, if you dig into any of those, you'll find issues. This is a tiny MCE, which is a WYSIWYG uh, JavaScript editor. It says here that 4711, 4712 are vulnerable. This actually matches the description. If actually we dig deeper, we'll see that the re the release page is mentioning new versions, which are also vulnerable. GitHub, they actually created a GitHub repo saying that, saying that version 5.0 up to 5.4.2.2 are also vulnerable, but that information doesn't exist in the feed that most uh, vulnerability scanners would actually write on to identify those. And honestly, this, the list goes on and on. And, and there are cases that affects the Android kernel. There are cases that affects um, the um, operating system kernels uh, and other operating systems. There are cases that affect some co very common Java, uh, Java libraries like Tika, which, which here it says it's only version 124 and it should be anything before that. And honestly, the list goes on and goes on with those cases. I'm not going to mention uh, all of them. So this is the problem that this is um, affecting uh, a lot of other projects. Like, for instance, there is the OWASP dependency check uh, project. And this project uh, allows you to um, uh, check what dependencies are vulnerable. However, if you go to the issues page, you'll see hundreds of false positive reports. There are less false negative reports uh, because usually what happens is that you do the check, it tells you that something is vulnerable, you try to, to see what patch actually fixes it, and you see actually there is no patch, this CV doesn't apply to my package. Um, false negative would require that someone is aware there is an issue and he's checking that something is, 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 uh, is vulnerable. And this comes from the fact that one, the data is garbage, but also the way we are reporting what is vulnerable through CPEs is actually completely useless. And that can, can be used to match against anything. 
So if the situation is bad, how are we trying to solve it? Well, there is two issues. There is an issue of uh, data quality and there is an issue of identification. So the issue of data quality, there is about 350 CVEs that are reported per week. About half could be discarded either because, for instance, these are hardware CVs and potentially we have no way of verifying it or, or potentially we don't really care. Some can actually, uh, we know usually that they are good quality. For instance, Apple will provide usually with good quality CVs and you could actually rely on those to determine that this particular version of iTunes or this particular version of iOS is, is vulnerable. Um, our attempts of trying to throw machine learning, actually trying to uh, fix the issue because the data is garbage, it will only produce garbage output. And there is no way to actually make any um, uh, conclusions out of this. Uh, it might help in pointing inconsistencies, but it will only point some inconsistencies, which mean that we still end up with having to manually vet everything because we don't know exactly if the data is, is good enough, which is a serious issue because the first um, resource that we are relying, we are not trusting, and we need actually to double check all the data. And at the same time, the vulnerabilities which are reported are not complete, and we need to rely on other external sources to fetch other data. And then there is the identification problem. And the identification, there are currently two ways which are usually used, either OS-based or package manager-based. And the one which I'm going to be talking about uh, are using fingerprinting. So OS-based, uh, what it does is that it, we have vulnerability information about OS packages, and we will try to identify, uh, to report that a certain package is outdated, please fix it. Package managers will uh, usually only work for open source packages, and that means we have access to a, um, a package dependency manifest, and we will see what dependencies are using and report on those. Fingerprinting means that we will actually take the out, uh, the, the, the um, the generated binary or the generated mobile application, or in some cases could be applied to a Docker file or to a jar file and be able to fingerprint what dependencies are in there and determine if those are vulnerable or not. The problem with this approach is it is much complex and much involved. The first approaches are simple. They allow us to just match against the string. As long as we have done the matching and said what is vulnerable, it actually works. Uh, for fingerprinting, we are matching against control flow graphs, against n-grams, against metadata that exists in the binary to be able to extract uh, the information if something is vulnerable or not. The disadvantage, however, of um, using the other approach is that, for instance, for package managers, we need access to source code, we need access to the package manifest to know exactly what is being added to the application to determine if something is vulnerable or not. This is not required for the OS and it's not required for the fingerprinting approach. Um, the limitation, however, is that package managers have uh, can have a good support for transitive dependencies. If I have A, which depends on B, which depends on C, uh, that information can usually be fetched by looking at each. This is at least how they work. They actually are able to get that information. If you even have a log file and the package manager is doing that, then you can easily rely on that. And if people are committing that, to, to the repo, which is not always the case, you can also rely on that to do the, the analysis. There are these caveats where it's not always the case, which for instance, people, either the package manager doesn't have a log file or people are not committing it for some reasons. There are even blog posts that people actually will tell you to not do that because it has some side effects, for instance, on security or other, um, or for instance, it doesn't work for libraries. Fingerprint actually doesn't uh, need access to, doesn't need to actually resolve transitive dependencies. If I know that a package B is vulnerable, that package will be in the final output. It will be in the final APK. It will be in the final IPA. And I can actually go there and check that dependency with that particular version is vulnerable. And I don't need to do any sort of uh, reverse resolution to determine if something is vulnerable or not. And finally, there is embedded code. Someone just takes the code, copy it, may or may not care about the licensing of the code and added it. And the first example, which I shown, which is the Cordova example, is a good example where uh, for some reasons we are adding the code. Sometimes it's very valid reasons. We are adding the code directly into our, um, our, our application or our library and we're not referencing any package manager. And in this case, we have no way of identifying other than, for instance, really saying that this package is actually vulnerable and then we do the, the full resolution. Or in the case of fingerprinting, we don't need to do that. The package will be added to the final binary and we can actually match against that. So how do we? How does fingerprinting work? We differentiate between two techniques and these are actually uh, something that comes from the malware world. We're not really in reinventing the world. There's something that has existed for decades to be able to identify, to identify malware. We are refurbishing these techniques for vulnerability analysis. 
So the first one is um, iOS fingerprinting. So iOS, uh, sorry, is shallow fingerprinting. So shallow fingerprinting, the way it works is that uh, there are certain attributes or certain places where we can extract the uh, the version information. To give, uh, to show an example, I'm gonna actually look at some. <clears throat> so to show an example, let me actually take some uh, some scan where we have that information, for instance, uh, alert. So <clears throat> actually, so we provide a community scanner where everyone can actually upload and, and, and do a scan. And, and the information about the dependencies and the vulnerability is something that, that, that we provide. So in this particular case, we're able to extract the dependency that exists in the application. This is, for instance, a lot of JavaScript dependencies that are in here, and we are able to, uh, to identify those. And we are able, in some cases, to extract the information, but in some cases, the version information is inaccurate. Like, for instance, this is coming from a file, or this is something which is latest, so we don't know exactly what uh, version information is there. It is allowing us to cover 80% of the cases, but other cases, it doesn't cover those. And this is where actually deep fingerprinting comes, is that it tries to address the limitations of shallow fingerprinting. We can do 80%, how about the other 20%? So <clears throat> the way deep fingerprinting works is that we try to extract features in the binaries to uniquely identify vulnerable versions. That is, for instance, the control flow graph, the strings, uh, some package names and uh, uh, some other metadata, and those are used, for instance, to determine if something is vulnerable. Like, for instance, I can show here another example where we're able to match against an open SSL. I think it's this one. We're able to determine that there is uh, an open SSL which is baked into open SSL which is added into LibSQL uh, cipher, and we're able to determine that this is this particular version which is uh, which is added um, added in here. The problem with this approach is that it requires indexing, indexing large volumes of data. For instance, to index jars or ARS, there are over 15 million in multiple uh, Maven repositories, and these would require some intensive analysis to actually extract them. Cocoa pods, there are over 70,000. NPM packages, there is actually, uh, well, there is much more, like the, it's one which is increasing the most, and there are millions of packages which are uh, which exist in there. However, uh, this approach, uh, so yes, so the way this actually, this approach works is that it, we extract a certain set of information, like we extract the control flow graph, we transform that into a vector representation that we can analyze afterwards. We extract the abstract syntax tree, we extract some other metadata. For instance, in Android, even if the application is obfuscated, in some cases they will include an attribute which is called source, and that one will potentially include the exact file name that was used from the application. So even if the application got named to a cryptic name, we might be able to reverse that back to what file? Um, to a certain, uh, to exactly the, the name of the file to be able to guess what application is actually, uh, is that. And that has the advantage of something of, for instance, this is a, uh, this is a dependency which is EGS, which is a, a template-based dependency. Uh, sorry, it's a template-based framework that allows us to, uh, to, um, uh, to include code, um, to, to render code in, 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 in HTML. Uh, and this this is a dependency which is commonly used in a mobile application. However, when it is used, it gets uh, minified, uh, minified and represented in this in this form. And in this particular example, this is a dependency which we did not manage to get the version. However, through fingerprinting, uh, we managed to determine that this particular dependency is missing a particular patch and is vulnerable to a cross class scripting. So, <clears throat> to to some some final notes. So um, third-party security is unfortunately not a solved problem. There is a lot of issues that either come from our current tooling or either come from the uh, the, the quality of the data that, that we have. Deep and shallow fingerprinting are approaches that allow us to address some of those issues, particularly in, in mobile applications. And this is something that any user can actually come to our platform and use it. And we will be sharing and publishing more details about how exactly this work. And at the same time, trying to chase those corner cases of the data to provide with better quality data. So that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Elidin. So do you, do you have a question? Maybe in between, can, can you show us the, the UI of, of Solab? Um, 
Sure. <clears throat> this is um, every scan. So this is the, the the dashboard that's used for users to actually manage their scan. Creating a scan is as basic as just uh, specifying the platform, uploading your application, and choosing one of the plans. One of the things is that users can actually specify credentials that are used during to exercise the scan, like for instance, login and password, or uh, credit card information, or some other attributes. Um, if the application requires UI, complex UI, they can specify also some UI information, but this is usually mostly for advanced cases, and, and, um, and that's it. And then actually the scan is submitted, and once the scan is created, the scan actually appears in the dashboard, it gets queued, and once it's processed, they have access to the, to the scan. Um, I'm going to show actually a scan which is more involved. Uh, so there are multiple profiles. There is only the static, which does only static analysis. There is static and dynamic, which does the full analysis, and, and backend, which also scans the backend. Once the scan is done, there is a report that tells you all the vulnerabilities that were found, some information about the, the, the scan, how it looks like, and the dependencies, which I showed. Uh, when the scan is run, there is a set of artifacts which are collected, like a screenshots, the logs of the files, uh, network traffic, all of these are collected and are accessible, and these could be helpful, for instance, to determine is the, did the application correctly test a certain uh, a certain a certain feature. Uh, the rest are mostly exporting the scans or generating a PDF. Uh, but yes, for every vulnerability, there is a detailed description. You can actually go over it. There is a description of the issue, some recommendation, some technical details about the to confirm that the issue matches uh, or to know exactly where where it is, and um, and um, and um, this applies for everything. In some cases, there is also decompiled source code. If, for instance, the, app, the vulnerability exists like in a, in, a, in a portion of the application, there is a code which is decompiled and shows you exactly where it is. Um, that's actually basically it. So, so you're, Al, you're, you're filtering um, OWASP references in, in the vulnerabilities or? Do we reference or was uh, we we in some cases we do it doesn't apply to everything but in the cases where it applies we do reference or was preferences in, in in the vulnerabilities as well yes okay because I've seen one or two okay so so we have a first question of Dinesh is community version as is this feature uh, in fact is there a community version first yes so anyone can actually come in and, and create a scan they, they there is a there is a there is either through the public platform and they can create scan those are scans are public or they can create an account and create a scan from here and uh, and those scans are only accessible to them so these features are, are accessible in the community scan they can sc create a scan now and then they will see the the all the fingerprinting information accessible in there okay then we have Another question of Younes: How the dynamic part works? How does the, the dynamic the dynamic analysis? Is this what it uh, about? Yes, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So the dynamic analysis, the 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 um, yeah, actually, might let me actually might be easier to. Yeah. So. Yeah, it doesn't really represent. So the so what happened is that once um, uh, once we install the app, so the dynamic part is about um, we install the application on a real device because there is a lot of features that requires a real device, like for instance Bluetooth, um, GPS, even that could actually work on simulators or emulators, uh, NFC, some mostly Bluetooth, which is actually the, the the pain point. So those features require a real device, and we install the application on a real device. What happens afterward is that we instrument the, the, the application through uh, debugging protocols. We use those because it allows us to have support always for the latest version versus other tools that do memory hooking. And they usually, uh, every time there is a new Android version or an iOS version, the runtime has, the layout of the memory has changed and it doesn't work. So we use introspection debug protocols to do the introspection in addition to uh, some uh, low level, uh, like file system um, and, and, and um, the network uh, uh, introspection, which is just proxying traffic using file notify to know exactly what's being done to the file system, et cetera. So all of those are instrumented. And then we keep monitoring the, how the application is, is, is interacting. There is a, a, a um, like what we call a monkey tester that keeps clicking on the different buttons, try to interact with it as much as possible. And traffic is actually monitored, like all these APIs are monitored. And if we identify something as insecure, then that is reported. Network traffic is afterwards collected, and this is the one that that is being sent to the to the to the to the backend engine, which tries to scan the back to scan the backend. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. We have another question of Amin. Can we apply the same fingerprinting techniques to identify VUNs in mobile application, binaries, containers, etc.? Well, these techniques are in um, are in uh, in theory generalizable. Uh, it can be applied to it can be applied to a container. It can be applied to a jar file. It can be applied to uh, to uh, to other environments where we don't have access to the to source code or we don't have access to or or the, the we don't only care about the OS. We also care about the uh, what exists in within the container. Like for instance, there is a lot of um, containers what are called uh, distro list. There is no operating system. You build your application and you only have all your dependencies in your application. So you need to actually analyze exactly the binary or the 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 the, the, the output that was that was. That was produced. So definitely, it it it, it applies. Um, at the moment, our support is only for mobile applications. Okay. Do we have other question? In fact, I have one. Um, do you have an an API? I guess yes. We do have an API. <laughs> we, so you can. Uh, let me actually. So we have an. Yeah. So we have a GraphQL API. I don't know if, if you're the ones who love them or hate them. I personally really like them. So there's an idea where you can actually play with the API. That is all the APIs that we provide, which are documented in here. You can create a scan. You can list, uh, get all the information that we, uh, this is the API that the UI is using. So it's it's exactly the same thing. So this is the API to list, uh, to list the vulnerabilities. So for instance, I would like to list all the vulnerabilities for this particular scan. For instance, I would like also the, the um, I would like also to have, the um, CVSS vector for this, then all of this information is, is accessible in here. And you can and you can either play with this and afterward build on that if you'd like to interact with the API. Okay. And the, the, the community version can be uh, used online. You, you... We only have a SaaS platform. We don't have, because actually, so one of the issues of doing, so uh, if you would like to use the platform, you would need to have a phone to do the full analysis. Um, to make it simple, we, we host everything on our site. You don't need to have the phone. You don't need to configure it. You don't need to manage it. You just upload the application and, and it works. Uh, so it, it's a SaaS platform. You upload your application and you get and you get scans. If you have your account, the results is only accessible to you. Thank you. I guess you're using a store lab a lot uh, to do the, the analysis of the COVID application you are uh, investigating now. We we are I, we, we are we are we there, there is there, we are pending some we are pending some public disclosures where we have so we we um, for the record we started reviewing um, uh, most contact tracing applications that are used by that are produced by government agencies. We are published already the first report for the application, which which didn't have any critical issues. At the moment, we are in the process of publicly uh, of waiting for the fixes of several issues before we can disclose um, the vulnerabilities that we have we have identified. But yes, we this is that was one of the key elements that allowed us to identify some of the uh, some of the issues that we flagged. Okay, we have another question. What is the difference between community version and enterprise version? So the the, the community version only does static analysis, uh, and uh, the limitation is actually in in the taint analysis. T taint analysis is extremely costly resource wise because what it does it's gonna take all the paths that exist in the application and try to see if there is any potential. Um, accessible path that can lead to a vulnerability. So that's actually super um, resource consuming and we provide only limited version for the community. We, we process thousands of community scans and we are able to do uh, to, to cover some of the common issues, but we cannot exercise fully the application. The paid version uh, allows you to cover all the passes. It can take uh, up to uh, 24 hours uh, to review a, a large application. And then there is the dynamic and the backend. That one, that one is only accessible in the paid version. Okay, seems fair. And another question for for me: uh, Why should I use Ostolab instead of uh, Mavsf? Uh, so, 
So I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I don't wanna go into the, the saying that we do something better or we do something, uh, uh, or, or we do, we, uh, MobSafe, I don't know if exactly it supports any any kind of uh, backend or, or, or dynamic capabilities, but this is a product where there is, there is that has been actually built for, for multiple years. We have support for, uh, way more cap capabilities that that exist in, in in other open source uh, products and anyone can actually upload the application data analysis is just one of those we are the only one who provide us that that provide this and you can upload an application and actually compare the results the dependency analysis is something that was recently added there was actually a lot of work of being able to fingerprint an application determine what dependencies what version is in there and the uh, other aspect is, unfortunately, the data quality, which I mentioned, is, is so bad that we had to maintain ours, and this includes way more vulnerability that we report. We provide this as a community, like as a community. People can actually use this. They don't need to pay for, for you to, to use this services. And the reason for that is that there is a lot of solo developers or small startups which are still building, and we do still want to want to manage to help them build secure applications. Our effort to, re to review the COVID-19 was an effort to, uh, this is something which which is going to be used for critical aspects for, for, for people privacy, and we wanted to help uh, with that. But um, there is more features and more capabilities that are included, and, and I would recommend you to just upload an application and test, and test, uh, and test yourself. OK. Do we have any more questions? I guess no. Ah, maybe one. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, or if if it, you can you can always send us an email. I shared in in the slides. We will should be sharing the slides afterwards. If you have if if you are interested. Okay. Ju just hold on a few seconds. We maybe have a question from Ibrahima. Okay, so the question is, is it something you recommend for testing application before installing on our phones <laughs> we don't do malware analysis so the, if you care about the so if uh, no um, uh, so uh, yes so if 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 the if the intent is actually try to evaluate the security of your application before before uh, before installing it and if it's something which is uh, which is obscure and you don't trust it then it, it's probably good to do that we see a lot of there is a lot of horrible things in, in, in those kind of applications that would, for instance, communicate over clear text. They will send a lot of PII, uh, like a, um, private information over clear text that anyone could see. Some of those, they even have an RCE and someone could actually compromise the phone. So some of the some of the COVID-19 application, we exactly found those cases. And this is why we cannot report them because we're waiting for the for, 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 for those um, uh, for those fixes. However, we are not a malware analysis product. We don't flag applications which are a malware. We do use the, the API of virus total to just send the hash and check if the hash of the application is a known uh, is a known virus. But it, that that, that, that it, it's not always it's not always perfect, uh, and and we don't do any deep analysis to flag if something is is uh, is malicious. Okay, uh, another question from Fred for iOS app scan should we push an unsafer version of the app yes yeah. yes so that's a that's an important question so so we 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 need an app so um, iOS the application when is it is encrypted it is encrypted with the key which is unique to the device uh, so if if we need to be able to analyze the application we need to have access to an application which is unencrypted so if, for instance, it's a developer, then the application that they would be uploading to the Play Store, uh, to, sorry, to the Apple Store would be the version that they can upload. If it is something that was retrieved from the phone through a jailbreak and then they dumped it from memory, then they would need to dump an encrypted version. Otherwise, we have no way of analyzing the application. We will report that something is encrypted. If we see an application that got uploaded and is encrypted, we will tell you it was encrypted. We managed to see this, but we didn't see everything because some attributes are still accessible. But in, in reality, we don't we can't do much when an application is encrypted. Okay. And in the case uh, of 
if I mean, if, if the application is coming from the App Store, uh, are you able to scan it? Uh, well, to download it and scan it. I mean, if I just provide the, the bundle ID. So we don't we don't provide that at the moment. It's not yet publicly accessible. Uh, we have been trying to build that um, for quite some time. It actually works. It's how it's easy to implement that for Android, and we have support for that. We just never made it uh, exposed for iOS. It, it's not. It's it's more complicated to actually get, get around some of the of the restrictions of the of the Apple Store, and you need to actually work with them to get access to that. So at the moment, we don't we don't provide that. What happens is that if if in some cases someone doesn't manage, they can actually it's mostly in uh, human interaction where they would request us to to do that, and then we will do that and and and, and analyze the application. But it's not something accessible through our UI. Okay, and maybe I've missed that. Uh, I I don't know. What about the the dynamic analysis of iOS? I guess you you, you don't do that at the moment. No. no, no, we absolutely do that. That's actually one. So iOS is so is so. Um, uh, I, there is a lot of limitations in doing static analysis. That a lot of our core capabilities come from dynamic analysis. iOS, we 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 all, we use the LL, we use the LLDB. We use the debug protocol to inst to uh, instrument the application. We don't require jailbroken devices to analyze it, but we are able to. Uh, Resign the application, put it on a device, and start analyzing uh, analyzing the application. I think one of the examples actually I shown here. I'm not sure if it's. Yeah, let me see. Uh, yes. So here, like, there is two examples. Like, this is an example of an iOS application, and that one it did get analyzed dynamically. And here, I think you'll see screenshots of the of the execution of the application. There are uh, logs which are collected from the device. All of this is done uh, through dynamic analysis. Oh yes, excellent. Okay, so I guess you're uh, in fact Ostolab is the only solution that do that. No, we're not the only solution. I'm gonna be fair. We're not the only solution that that does that. There are other products that does that. Um, some are accessible. They have no actually. Uh, the ones that that claim to do that, they don't have a, a community version, so we haven't tested them. So I cannot actually speak about the merit of, of what they do. But there are other products who provide this kind of uh, um, of capabilities. Okay. Thank you, Al. I guess we don't have any any other question. Well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> if you have any other questions, just shoot me an email. I'll be happy, happy to answer them. And, and and thanks for the thanks for the questions.